clay is fashioned into vessels, but it is their empty hollowness that their use depends. Lao Tzu. Welcome to Warfare, Advancement, and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and as always, I am your host. I'd like to thank everyone who's continued to listen so far, and I hope you continue to do so. So last week's episode, we covered Southeast Asia, or at least mainland Southeast Asia. This week, we're going to go a little bit further to the north and the east, up into what is modern-day China, Korea, and then, of course, off the coasts of those two locations, into Japan and the Ryukyu Islands, as well as Taiwan. But before we do that, I do have a little bit of feedback I wanted to get into. Uh, so this actually, the first bit goes back to the episode prior to the week prior from last week, the one in India. Uh, someone had asked, uh, I had mentioned that some of those tribal groups, uh, specifically the Adam and Eve, never had written language until recently, and they asked what I meant by recently, and I should have been clearer than, uh, on that point. Um, but again, depending on the group, that's a different answer. Um, some well after uh, the Europeans arrived, or at least the, the French and the English arrived. Um, I think there are a few late adopters of script at that point, um, but some of them did not even have a writing system up until I believe the 50s or 60s, uh, the 1950s or 60s. So again, there's very wide time frame on that, and we'll get into why that never developed in, in future episodes. Um, but I do want to thank uh, our listener for that little question and clarification. It is something I should have been a little bit clearer on. Uh, the other bit of feedback comes from someone asking uh, why I didn't go over um, the islands of Southeast Asia. Of course, there's a large number of those around uh, you know, the Philippines, Papua New Guinea, all that type of locations. Um, I will be getting into those. Uh, I decided to include them with um, the episode on Australia uh, because otherwise that Australian episode is just going to be very short uh, and it may even only even including those islands it may only be a one episode type deal so um, that's that's why uh, but as we'll get into when we talk about Taiwan in this episode um, Taiwan and those places are linked, or at least they will be linked a little bit closer uh, coming up in the near future, quote-unquote. So, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and focus on the meat of this episode, of course, and that's going to be uh, what is today uh, China. So, now... We, of course, we have the standard mode of human living uh, at this time, 2000 BC, which is still hunting and gathering. And, of course, China, a uh, very large location, uh, but there are a number of regions in that area uh, that are ideal for that type of lifestyle. Uh, depending on how you organize things, China, hit, China has anywhere between three to seven really massive river systems with numerous lakes between and around those systems. Um, and any of these river systems would feature a wide variety of plants and animals surrounding them, which of course draws in humans. Um, and, if, you know, there is no telling how many small groups of humans were living in and around these river systems, migrating between them, uh, spreading through them. Uh, traveling back and forth, any and all of them would have played, well, most of all of them would play excellent like, for locations to live for a, you know, a period of time. But the most important of these rivers, uh, or the river system, is the Yangtze, or this is officially referred to in China today as uh, the Shangjiang. And if you're wondering about the discrepancy in the name, uh, Yangtze is derived from the name for an old um, feudal domain during the imperial periods of China. Yang is the name of the domain. And most European and Western countries still display this name on maps, especially, you know, maps from 
couple of decades back. Um, internally, China refers it to it by Chongjiang, which means literally the Long River. Uh, of course, it you know it has other you know internal names living there. Some people um, you know depending on the dialect of Chinese, um, some people refer to it as the Dajiang, which just means Great River, or just Jiang, the river. Um, and it is uh, it is the third longest river in the world, and it's the longest in China. And um, you know that's uh, you know it's it's very important for that should make it sound you know that should give you an idea of how important it's going to be to the to the region. And all and the Changjiang and all these river systems uh, have led to numerous canyons and gorges. Uh, and it shouldn't come as a surprise. You know, surprised that these caves and canyons and areas are, you know, there there were decent locations for uh, early human settlements um, or resting places. Uh, they may have only been occupied temporarily. In fact, most of them were just o- occupied probably seasonally or migrationally. Um, so, and of course, uh, fishing is an excellent supplement to hunting and gathering, which um, most of these areas in East Asia uh, are going to be uh, very reliant in the future uh, to for fish to supplement different diets. Um, now, we talked about the three agent system quite a while back, uh, you know, dividing uh, time into the Stone, um, Stone Age, uh, Bronze Age, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and how that's changed over time and you know things break down to like pre-pottery periods um, in China uh, or in East Asia in general not just China uh, pottery is much older than it is in the um, West or at least in Western Asia uh, they have been using pots in this region uh, since uh, 20,000 years ago I believe uh, there is a cave in um, are along the Yangtze River, um, known as Jean Rendon Cave. Uh, there were numerous potsherds found there uh, a few decades ago, and they have been dated to around 20,000 years old. Uh, so they are in the pre pottery stages uh, well before, um, or they've been in the pottery stages, I should say, uh, while, you know. The Middle East is still in the pre-pottery Neolithic area. Um, now, what these pots were used for um, wasn't known for a little while because they didn't do a chemical analysis until fairly recently. I think they did a few different tests and they found um, they did a lipid test and they found fat residue. And essentially, uh, these pots are used mostly for cooking or for um, storage of water. Uh, They're flat bottomed, or they were flat bottomed, or that's how they've been reconstructed, so they could sit essentially in a fire and cook that way. Um, And what they cooked depend on the region and availability. Um, I think in John Rendong specifically, they found a lot of uh, fish lipids and fat. Um, So, yeah, they were probably getting a lot of their meals directly um, from fish. but there were some areas that had um, some type of deer or ungulate, uh, maybe wild goats, possibly wild cattle, um, that were cooked as well. And you see various um, different pottery locations all along, not just in China, but uh, further north into what is now Russia and the Mongolian steppe. Uh, along several rivers there, and they, of course, you know, they feature a little bit more heavily on the deer diet. Um, we don't really have a name for uh, this this early pottery culture. Uh, it's kind of isolated, I think, um, from other areas. Uh, this type of pottery doesn't show up. Um, around the area and later you know later pottery that's similar in China is a is much younger Uh, it's it's much more recent Um, so you know is this just the earliest we found 
uh, probably. Well, obviously, it's the earliest we found. But is this the first example? Is this the first location this type of pottery was used? Or is this just the earliest that we found, I should say? So uh, it's certainly possible that this is the region that pottery was developed um, in, in Asia. Uh, and it is also possible that it was one of the other rivers or tributaries in China and then that got spread you know further south or further north uh, and this is just the first thing that was you know not destroyed because those shards in Jianlindong cave um, you know they were they were very heavily destroyed uh, the reconstruction work on these is I'm sure very very painstaking um, but you know they, they they have been verified they have been uh, tested uh, by a number of different sources but everything as far as I can tell everyone is very you know sure that the date on these is accurate um, the oh also the name of the cave Jean Ren uh, which is is the name and Jean Ren Dong it means cave in China so Jean Ren cave in English is fine uh, but the name actually comes from uh, Taoist mythology um, hits the quote at the start of this episode. I figured I'd use a quote from uh, Wild Z. Uh, but uh, essentially, uh, Jean is used, um, it's used in a few different ways in the language. Um, it refers to kind of like a group of uh, sages, uh, for lack of a better term. And it could also mean a few different things. It's not just Hold on one moment. I'm going to pause the episode. All right, those fire trucks are gone. So yes, uh, Jean can mean a few different things. Um, in this case, it's probably used closer to the definition for sage or uh, uh, shaman or enlightened person. Uh, it can also be used for things like um, uh, in in immortal or possibly like a like a um, a spirit like a you know like a puckish uh, spirit things like um, uh, fairies or um, nymphs things like that um, and we'll get into we'll actually go into some specific myths on that when we get to a little bit further along in the historical timeline uh, when I guess the Chinese mythology kind of comes about it, the Jian Ren uh, name comes much later. It comes from the people who found the cave. So uh, that's kind of the origin of the place name. But again, uh, most of the river systems in China would be occupied at some time or another by various groups. Uh, there is no one large monoculture. Um, there is a certain level of continuity between tools in the region but there's not like a specific area that those are recognized to have emerged in um, so there's no there's no kind of like central homeland uh, for this culture um, but that being said um, the culture in China at 10,000 BC, China is becoming a little bit more um, uh, populated. I think uh, it, it's going to start to see, especially once agricultural takes like full charge, um, it's going to become much more populated. Um, but I think also by 10,000 BC, with the climate change, the area is much was probably much more tropical than it is today. Um, there's still some tropics out towards the west and south in China, but uh, those were probably a little bit more widespread, so it, it probably kept people from moving into or out of the region a little bit better. Also, um, with the, um, the weather at some point, uh, Taiwan, which is the next area we're gonna study here, uh, was connected very briefly to the mainland via um, via a land bridge uh, that has probably been uh, cyclical um, or at least it has been exposed at various parts 
um, you know, various different times when, um, when uh, the climate changes uh, and it gets uh, colder, you know, once the, um, uh, the, uh, the glacial maximum or ice caps expand, <clears throat> excuse me, um, once those kind of rise and, you know, rise and fall, it would make uh, Taiwan easier to get to at different times. Um, you can tell that there are, uh, there were uh, different types of megafauna that people were probably following to, you know, to get there. Uh, but at 10,000 BC, uh, uh, Taiwan is probably mostly made up of of a people that are more closely related to the peoples along the very southern tip of uh, Vietnam and Cambodia. Um, that's kind of the, at least the assumption. I think that the earliest bones they found on Taiwan, uh, they did they did find a sampled for DNA there, uh, and they were able to kind of see that it had a little bit more in common with peoples in that region than with um, the current day population of say China. Um, but of course, you know you take that with a grain of salt. It was a very small sample, so it it may not be entirely representative. Um, but at the very least, we know that the people. Uh, living there at this time frame um, they do eventually go and Taiwan's kind of a jumping off point for a lot of the smaller um, islands uh, in uh, the Southeast Asia area um, they do definitely lend a sizable if not all of their uh, descent to a lot of those groups uh, basically Austronesians um, were probably the people living there at the time that we're discussing uh, and then eventually um, and again we'll get to it in future episodes but eventually uh, agriculture and agriculturalists from China will probably enter the region uh, and they'll you know that'll create its kind of own culture uh, that is separate from both the mainland and from the other islands but again that's for future stuff but at this time um, they have the they have a separate their tools are a lot different from what you'd see in mainland China and even in Southeast Asia so they've probably been here for maybe 10,000 years or so developing their own um, their own tool making uh, and they probably have some type of uh, Austronesian proto Austronesian language that they're speaking now to go a little bit further north uh, and I guess to, well, just north for Taiwan, but a little bit north and east from uh, what we were discussing, the Dong Cave in uh, China. We're going to go uh, up to the Korean Peninsula. But along the way, we do need to say, as you begin to move uh, north and east from the Dong Cave area, um, China becomes much more of a plain. Um, uh, and it becomes a little bit more of a grassland, uh, which eventually will become very good farmland. Uh, so that, uh, that northern Chinese plain is very important. The people there are living a much more traditional hunter-gatherer lifestyle than people in the south. There are rivers, there are sources of water, but uh, unless you're along the coast, I don't think you would have nearly as much options in terms of uh, fish or uh, water uh, food to kind of um, to um, uh, go for as opposed to uh, in the plains you're probably looking at uh, a little bit more um, herd animals uh, to, to kind of look at and then of course uh, to the northwest you're getting into uh, mountainous terrain uh, especially in the north very dry mountainous terrain which uh, you know, there you're, you're looking at much less in terms of uh, even vegetation and um, uh, fishing. So there you're definitely going for uh, herd animals. Uh, so there is, uh, just keep that in mind. And then of course, as you go north on the plain, again, you run into even more mountains that kind of divide the steppe from China. 
uh, and then as you turn east along that uh, the bays there and the coastline uh, you are going to get into a kind of a mountain pass to the northeast and that's going to take you to what is uh, today known as uh, the Liaodong Peninsula and then from that point is kind of like one of your entries into what is the now the Korean Peninsula um, so basically you curve around that little uh, bay uh, and then you have another little bit of a plane uh, that turns into a step uh, and then that that plane is divided from Korea and the rest of the Mongol step by a uh, couple of different mountain ranges. Uh, in North Korea, of course, in the north, there are very, uh, very rough mountains and that's kind of allow Korea or the people living in Korea to kind of develop a separate culture from uh, the peoples of the steppe in China. Uh, in the north, it's a little bit more mountainous, but then you also have a plain along the western half of the Korean Peninsula, and that goes south, and it from there, um, you do have a little bit more mountains in the south, like that cover most of the peninsula as opposed to just the eastern half and the north, but between those mountainous areas, there are several different kind of low flatlands uh, that kind of that, uh, that are, of course, today major settlement points in the south of China. So the people living there, they have been living uh, probably for about 40 to 50,000 years in Korea at this point, at least Homo sapiens. Uh, you know, I'm sure that there were, I think Homo erectus, they found some evidence of them being in the area. This is kind of as north as they went. Uh, but I think right now the oldest is about 40 to 50,000 years that they've been able to find. And in this area, there are, of course, uh, there have been remains of woolly rhinos, uh, cave bears, brown bears, uh, hyenas, and several different um, varieties of deer. And most of those are um, now extinct. Uh, you know, I'm sure humans contributed a bit to those factors, but of course, um, this is one of those things we talked about. Uh, quite a few episodes ago at this point where uh, you had that uh, mass megafauna die-off uh, and whether or not it was completely related to humans or if it was just, just due to the climate changing. Uh, so the tools here are slightly different from um, the ones in China. Uh, they have, in addition to stone, you see a lot of antler or bone type items that are made. Uh, they have their own form of pottery. Uh, that uh, that is separate from the genre Dong Cave, or at least um, it's newer and it's evolved its kind of own style. It has a very wider brim at the top, and then at the um, bottom, it's it's much more like a um, what you might consider an urn. It's very plain. It's very flat. There are no corded ware or um, like curved. Like there's uh, the the lip of the of the jar itself is is very uh, thin. It's not like curved over on itself. It's not it's not lit. It's it's flat basically, but it is fairly large uh, for those you know for the size. Um, now Koreans themselves they use a similar three age system to kind of go into you know Korean prehistory, um, and this was done I think after World War Two. So it's kind of done, they, they kind of use that as a way to kind of um, counteract the, you know, some of the Imperial Japanese um, claims that uh, Korea kind of did not have its own Bronze Age culture, whereas Japan did to kind of show that they were less, you know, a lesser people. Uh, spoiler, the Europeans did that to the Africans. Um, which, you know, we'll get into that in future stuff, like why that happened. Um, but it should be noted that uh, at this point, there is a very high possibility um, that the Koreans, in addition to 
having pottery. Um, the eight uh, that could be a little bit later. It could be about two thousand years from now. Although again, um, I'm of the opinion that the stuff we have is not the first example. It's just you know the earliest we've found, and it's very possible that uh, that pottery had been in the region for much longer, considering how long it's been in China. Um, but this this kind of period is known as uh, the Jewel Jewel Moon period, uh, Jewel Moon pottery period. Um, this comes in a couple of phases. At this point, um, I think at the if it's not yet there, you're kind of in the the proto Jewel Moon pottery period, and uh, the Koreans themselves will call the period immediately after this the incipient period. Um, I will say that the three age system is not the best to use in Korea um, because again they didn't have some of those uh, requirements to get bronze. Um, I don't think the imperial Japanese claims were correct but uh, I do think that, you know, I understand why they wanted to kind of differentiate their history from the way it was being told by the Imperial Japanese. Um, but I don't know if the system they decided on is the best. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you see more revision to that in the future. But um, Korea, basically because of this, they're going to be in what's known as the Neolithic, the, the New Stone Age. They're going to be in the New Stone Age for a lot longer than uh, some of the surrounding cultures, at least uh, when it comes to how they describe themselves. And because of that, you know, I think a lot of people, they do want to kind of, you know, respect the Korean wishes. Uh, and again, I can understand why. So uh, you will see other people, uh, especially Westerners, use these same terminologies. Even though, again, I think, I think you're probably better off coming up with your own kind of dating system at that point. Uh, but again, the Koreans kind of wanted to separate themselves from the Imperial Japanese and also kind of put themselves on equal footings with uh, the Europeans and the West. So take to that what you will. And uh, of course, when we jump forward again in the timeline, yeah, we'll come back here. We'll go more into depth into the uh, Jula Moon period because uh, it's going to last for a while. At least um, it's going to cover several episodes uh, of future Korea. Uh, or it's going to cover several episodes that are going to be covered. Uh, ah, I've lost my... Sorry. Several future episodes on Korea are going to be focused on the Jula Moon period pottery period. So, there we go. Now, uh, speaking of Japan, or at least Japanese people, we are going to move on now to um, the uh, Japanese islands. Now, Japan, of course, and Korea were connected by a land bridge. If you go south to the Korean Peninsula, you can see that there are a few islands kind of between uh, Japan's southernmost large island, Kyushu. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, the largest of those islands is Jeju, I believe is how it's pronounced. And then, of course, another one uh, would be uh, Tsushima, is another island kind of in those chains. Uh, so at one point, you know, Korea and Japan were connected. Uh, the people that, you know, came through Korea or the people that lived in Japan came through Korea um, so they they were you know related at a very earlier period um, and in Japan this is what is known as the incipient Jomon period and this period actually lasts for probably like 2,000 years prior to this, so 12,000 BC, which is the end of the last glacial maximum or last glacial period, uh, and that's caused the sea levels to rise. So at that point, Japanese had been isolated from mainland Japan at this point, or I'm sorry, mainland 
Japan has been isolated from mainland Asia, Korea, at this point for about 2,000 years. Uh, I think um, it was still probably a little bit closer. It, it's probably not exactly the same sea levels as you see today. Uh, it probably was a little bit lower. So, you know, Jeju, uh, Kyushu, and the southern bit of Korea probably had a little bit more land than they do now, but that's here or there. So, uh, the incipient Jomon, you see this... Um, this is a very much hunter-gatherer society, but they do develop a bit of sedentaryism or sedentism. They have semi-permanent settlements much earlier than other hunter-gatherer cultures, at least that I can see. Uh, and you know, again, they were probably moving seasonally. Um, they had kind of pit dwellings. They kind of dug down, not you know super deep, but uh, probably a few feet, and then they began to develop like roofing or coverings thatch uh, and then put it over these kind of areas uh, but these are you know this is very early eventually they're going to develop you know into a much more sedentary society uh, and they're going to kind of advance their housing technology <laughs> um, but yeah the early the early period you're definitely seeing uh, some uh, sedentary the incipient period you're seeing a little bit more sedentism now whether it's happening this early I don't know uh, I couldn't really find too many hard sources on this uh, but the Jomon period in Japan much like the Jel, uh, Jelumon pottery period uh, these are very long periods uh, we're talking thousands of years um, the incipient and the kind of the the incipient Jomo period is going to last for a while. Uh, we're I mean it's already it already has lasted for a while. Um, again, at least two thousand years, maybe even more than that, and it's going to continue to about five thousand BC. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, in terms of um, uh, nature on the island so the the archipelago in the south is a much more uh, tropical at least at this time it's going to start to change um, in the south western part you're going to have um, you're going to see more evergreen trees uh, whereas uh, towards uh, the northeast uh, and you're going to see um, more uh, deciduous trees, conifers, and things like that. Uh, but so, of course, that gives you things like um, uh, chestnuts, oaks, things like that. So there's going to be a lot of edible nuts. Uh, that's going to be a a very big part of the food source of the people living there. Uh, in terms of what you get by uh, gathering, uh, you also will have uh, wild boars. Um, and of course that probably led to some type of uh, pig um, probably not fully domesticated for quite a while at least as far as I'm aware um, but uh, they do have a certain level of um, of management of wild hogs um, of course hogs can become feral fairly quickly that's something uh, everyone would have to deal with so it's entirely possible that they have um, kind of domesticated pigs and lost them and got them back and we would have no way of possibly knowing that um, deer uh, are very important uh, this, uh, uh, there are still of course wild deer in Japan um, they also have tubers and different freshwater fish uh, of course fish is going to be very important especially in the, uh, the south of Japan at least in these early days and of course that will spread as time goes on um, but uh, the, the Jomon kind of covers a lot of the coastal regions. Uh, in the kind of the south, uh, you'll see much more uh, coverage, but there are you know, locations all around the edges of Japanese coastline of what is today, today, the Japan today. There's basically coastline anywhere there's coastline there today people living there are probably evidence of 
least Jomo passing through, even in Hokkaido, which is the northern island. Um, now, they only go to the south of Hokkaido. They don't go up towards um, uh, the more cold climbs, which makes sense. Um, even even then, it's it was even in a more tropical environment, it was still extremely cold uh, in those locations. So you only see them go up to about uh, the southern tip of Hokkaido. Uh, so let's see where we are. Uh, the episode's been running about ooh, good lord, Th wow, thirty thirty five minutes. Okay. Uh, I've got to do a little bit of editing here. Um, not a lot because, um, yeah, this has been a really good episode. We've covered a lot of ground. Uh, next week, we're going to kind of finish off uh, Asia. We're going to kind of go over some of the cultures along the steppe. Um, and then we'll cover back towards, uh, we'll go back towards the west, closer to Europe. We'll end up on the Eurasian steppe. Uh, I'm going to try to go ahead and finish off the rest of Asia next week. And then after that, we'll go to, um, yeah, let's go back. We'll go back to, uh, I think, Australia. Well, I'll need to check my sources. I've already started scripting both the Europe and the, the Australian episodes. I'll see how time is looking. But, um, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Um, please provide me any feedback or any questions. You can reach me at war at revpod at gmail.com or you can reach me uh, at the Twitter feed. My DMs are open. Um, do you want to get a little bit more house cleaning? Uh, so uh, we are, as of today, uh, it is August the 7th. Uh, so uh, there are, uh, let's see, there are three more Sundays in August. Um, I plan on doing episodes from, let's see, yeah, so the 14th, the 21st, 28th, those will be pretty standard. Uh, I will be doing one on the 4th. Um, there is a holiday in America on Monday the 5th, but I do plan on doing a standard um, episode. In fact, I will be doing standard episodes until the week of the 25th of September, I believe. Uh, that week, I am out of town. I have a vacation plan with some friends. In fact, that actually may be... Let me confirm. Yes, so... Okay, yes, so I have the 23rd. Yeah, so that will be that week of the 26th. There will not be an episode, most likely. I may try to record like a little supplemental episode in the meantime, but uh, definitely not one that week, and possibly not one the week after, depending on how my travel goes, and you know if I'm able to uh, <laughs> uh, escape from any type of infections, from any kind of diseases uh, like uh, certain uh, COVIDs. So um, yeah, but so we still have a few weeks before that. Um, I do kind of want to do something a little bit different for October. I'm trying to think of maybe doing like um, just kind of, uh, you know, fiction or fantasy kind of books. Um, I may do a report on Playing of the Cave Bear, I think that's the one I'm thinking of. But if anyone has any kind of like historical horror or possibly uh, fiction or fantasy that you'd kind of like me to take a look at for like a s October special. Um, I'll just do some supplemental episodes while I'm trying to, you know, get uh, research done for the next little section. Um, so, yeah, please give me any feedback. I very much appreciate it. Uh, so if you have any uh, desire to hear anything specific, please let me know. But, yeah, thank you guys for listening, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.